thank you, President Hennessy, and uh, to the trustees and the faculty, to all of the parents and grandparents, to you, the Stanford graduates, thank you for letting me share this amazing day with you. Uh, I need to begin by letting everyone in on a little secret. The secret is that Kirby Bumpus Stanford class of 08 is my goddaughter. So I was thrilled when President Hennessy asked me to be a commencement speaker because this is the first time I've been allowed on campus since Kirby's been here. You see, Kirby's a very smart girl. She wants people to get to know her on her own terms, she says, not in terms of who she knows. So she never wants anyone who's first meeting her to know that I know her and she knows me. So when she first came to Stanford for new student orientation with her mom, uh, I hear that they arrived and everybody was so welcoming and somebody came up to Kirby and they said, oh my God, that's Gail King, because a lot of people know Gail King is my BFF. And uh, so somebody comes up to Kirby and they say, oh my God, is that Gail King? And Kirby's like, uh-huh, she's my mom. And so the person says, oh my God, does it mean like, you know, Oprah Winfrey? And Kirby says, sort of. I said, sort of? You sort of know me? Well, I have photographic proof. I have pictures, which I can email to you all, of uh, Kirby uh, riding horsey with me on all fours. So I more than sort of know Kirby Bumpus. And I'm so happy to be here. Uh, just happy that I finally, after four years, get to see her room. Uh, there's really nowhere else I'd rather be because I'm so proud of Kirby who graduates today with two degrees, one in human bio and the other in psychology. Love you, Kirby Cakes. That's how well I know her. I can call her Cakes. And so proud of her mother and father who helped her get through this time and her brother Will. I really had nothing to do with uh, her graduating from Stanford, but every time anybody's asked me in the past couple of weeks what I was doing, I'd say, I'm getting ready to go to Stanford. I just love saying Stanford. <laughs> because the truth is, I know I would have never gotten my degree at all because I didn't go to Stanford. I went to uh, Tennessee State University, but I never would have gotten my diploma uh, at all because I was supposed to graduate back in 1975. But I was short one credit. I was short one credit. And I figured I'm gonna just forget it because, uh, you know, I'm not gonna march with my class. Because by that point, I was already on television. I'd been in television since I was 19 and a sophomore. Granted, I was the only television anchor person that had an 11 o'clock curfew doing the 10 o'clock news. Seriously, my dad was like, well, that news is over 10.30, be home by 11. Uh, but that didn't matter to me because I was earning a living. I was on my way, so I thought, I'm going to let this college thing go, and I only had one credit. But my father, from that time on, and for years after, was always on my case because I did not graduate. He'd say, Oprah Gale, that's my middle name, I don't know what you're going to do without that degree. And I'd say, but Dad... I have my own television show. And he'd say, well, I still don't know what you're going to do without that degree. And I'd say, but Dad, now I'm a talk show host. He'd say, I don't know how you're going to get another job without that degree. <laughs> so in 1987, Tennessee State University invited me back uh, to speak at their commencement. By then, I had my own show, was nationally syndicated. I'd made a movie, had been nominated for an Oscar and founded my company, Harpo. But I told them, I cannot come and give a speech unless I can earn one more credit, because my dad's still saying, 
I'm not going to get anywhere without that degree. So I finished my coursework, I turned in my uh, final paper, and I got the degree. And uh, my dad was very proud, and I know that if anything happens, that one credit will be my salvation. But I also know why my dad was uh, insisting on that diploma, because as B.B. King put it, the beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take that away from you. And learning is really, in the broadest sense, what I really want to talk about today, because your education, of course, isn't ending here. In many ways, it's only just begun. The world has so many lessons to teach you. I consider the world, this earth, to be like a school, and our life, the classrooms. And sometimes, here in this planet Earth School, the lessons often come dressed up as detours or roadblocks and sometimes as full-blown crises. And the secret I've learned to getting ahead is being open to the lessons, lessons from the grandest universe of all, that is the universe itself. It's being able to walk through life eager and open to self-improvement and that which is going to best help you evolve, because that's really why we're here, to evolve as human beings. So, to grow into being more of ourselves, always moving to the next level of understanding, the next level of compassion and growth. I think the great, one of the greatest compliments I've ever received, I interviewed with a reporter when I was first starting out in Chicago, and then many years later I saw the same reporter and she said to me, you know what? You really haven't changed. You've just become more of yourself. And that is really what we're all trying to do, become more of ourselves. And I believe that there is a lesson in almost everything that you do in every experience. And getting the lesson is how you move forward. It's how you enrich your spirit. And trust me, I know that inner wisdom is more precious than wealth. The more you spend it, the more you gain. So today, I just want to share a few lessons, meaning three that I've learned in my journey so far. And aren't you glad? Don't you hate it when somebody says, I'm going to share a few, and it's 10 lessons later? And you're like, listen, this is my graduation. This is not about you. Uh, so it's only going to be three. The three lessons that have had the greatest impact on my life have to do with feelings, with failure, and with finding happiness. A year after I left college, I was given the opportunity to co-anchor the 6 o'clock news in Baltimore, because the whole goal in, uh, in, in the media at the time uh, I was coming up was that you try to move to larger markets, and Baltimore was a much larger market than Nashville, so getting the 6 o'clock news co-anchor job at 22 was such a big deal. It felt like the biggest deal in the world at the time, and I was so proud because I was finally going to have my chance to be like Barbara Walters which is who I've been trying to emulate since the start of my TV career. So I was 22 years old, making 22000 a year. And it's where I met uh, my best friend, Gail, who was an intern at the same TV station. And once we became, we became friends, we'd say, oh my god, I can't believe it. You're making 22000 and you're only 22. Imagine when you're 40 and you're making 40. When I turned 40, I was so glad that didn't happen. So here I am, 22, making $22,000 a year, and yet it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. The first sign, as President Hennessy was saying, was when they uh, tried to change my name. The news director said to me at the time, nobody's going to remember Oprah, so we want to change your name. We've come up with a name we think that people will remember and people will like. It's a friendly name, Susie. Hi, Susie. Very friendly. You can't be angry with Susie. Remember Susie. But my name wasn't Susie. And you know, I'd grown up not really loving my name because when you're looking for your little name on the lunch boxes and the license plate tags, you're never going to find Oprah. So I grew up not loving the name, but once I was asked to change it, I thought, well, it is my name. And do I look like a Susie to you? So 
I thought, no, it doesn't feel right. I'm not going to change my name, and if people remember it or not, that's okay. And then they said they didn't like the way I looked. This was in 1976 where your boss could call you in and say, I don't like the way you look. Now that would be called lawsuit, but uh, <laughs> back then they could just say, I don't like the way you look. Which in case some of you in the back, if you're, you can't tell, is nothing like Barbara Walters. So they sent me to a salon where they gave me a perm and after a few days all my hair fell out and I had to shave my head. And then they really didn't like the way I looked. Because now I am black and bald and sitting on TV. <laughs> Not a pretty picture. But even worse than being bald, I really hated, hated, hated being sent to report on other people's tragedies as a part of my daily duty. Knowing that I was just expected to observe when everything in my instinct told me that I should be doing something. I should be lending a hand. So, as President Hennessy said, I'd cover a fire, and then I'd go back and I'd try to give the victims blankets. And uh, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night because of all the things I was covering during the day. And meanwhile, I was trying to sit gracefully like Barbara and uh, make myself uh, talk like Barbara. And I thought, well, I could make a pretty goofy Barbara, and if I could figure out how to be myself, I could be a pretty good Oprah. I was trying to sound elegant like Barbara, and sometimes I didn't read my copy because something inside me said, this should be spontaneous, you know, it should be spontaneous. So I wanted to get the news as I was giving it to the people, so sometimes I wouldn't read my copy and it'd be like, six people in a pileup on I-40, oh my goodness. Sometimes I wouldn't read the copy and I'd be, because I wanted to be spontaneous, and I'd come across a list of words I didn't know and mispronounce, and one day I was reading copy and I call Canada, Canada. And I did just that. I cracked myself up on the air. And I decided, oh, this Barbara thing's not going too well. I should try being myself. But at the same time, my dad was saying, Opa Gale, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. You better keep that job. And my boss was saying, this is the nightly news. You're an anchor, not a social worker. Just do your job. So I was juggling these messages of expectation and obligation and feeling really miserable with myself. I'd go home at night and fill up my journals, because I've kept a journal since I was 15, so I now have volumes of journals. So I'd go home at night and fill up my journals about how miserable I was and frustrated, and then I'd eat my anxiety. That's where I learned that habit. And after eight months, I lost that job. They said I was too emotional, I was too much. But since they didn't want to pay out the contract, they put me on a talk show in Baltimore. And the moment I sat down on that show, the moment I did, I felt like I'd come home. I realized that TV could be more than just a playground, but a platform for service, for helping other people lift their lives. And the moment I sat down doing that talk show, it felt like breathing. It felt, it felt right. And that's where everything that followed for me began. And I got that lesson. When you're doing the work you're meant to do, it feels right. And every day is a bonus, regardless of what you're getting paid. It's true. And how do you know when you're doing something right? How do you know that? It feels so. What I know now is that feelings are really your GPS system for life. When you're supposed to do something or not supposed to do something, your emotional guidance system lets you know. The trick is to learn to check your ego at the door and start checking your gut instead. Every right decision I've made, every right decision I've ever made has come from my gut. And every wrong decision I've ever made was a result of me not listening to the greater voice of myself. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. That's the lesson. And that lesson alone will save you, my friends, a lot of grief. 
Even doubt means don't. This is what I've learned. There are many times when you don't know what to do. When you don't know what to do, get still. Get very still until you do know what to do. And when you do get still and let your internal motivation be the driver, not only will your personal life improve, but you will gain a competitive edge in the working world as well. Because as Daniel Pink writes in his bestseller, A Whole New Mind, he says we're entering a whole new age, and he calls it 